This video is about how to find good parameters for a machine learning model. The search for good parameters is known as optimization, and the tool we use is known as an optimizer. For a long time, the Atom Atomizer has been the default choice. But now, there is a new exciting challenger, the Muon Optimizer. The Muon Optimizer is getting increasingly more attention in the machine learning community. It's delivering impressive results on small language models and is about twice as computationally efficient as Atom W. In other words, you can train faster, use less memory, and still get great results. Let's first revisit Atom. In standard supervised learning, we have a model that makes predictions based on the input data. At first, these predictions are just random guesses, since the model's parameters are initialized randomly. We use the training data to compute the gradient of the loss with respect to each parameter. The gradient acts like a guide, showing us which direction the parameters should move to reduce the loss most effectively. By updating the parameters in this direction at each step, the model gradually becomes better at making accurate predictions. This is known as gradient descent. Adam builds on gradient descent but maintains two exponential moving averages of variables, one for the past gradients themselves, called momentum, and another for the square gradients. Rather than updating parameters directly from the raw gradients, Adam combines the momentum with an adaptive scaling factor derived from the square gradients. This allows Adam to converge more quickly and often achieve better results than standard gradient descent. But there's a catch. Adam requires keeping two extra variables for every model parameter. As a result, the optimizer state takes up about twice as much memory as the model itself. Furthermore, Adam treats all the parameters as a single long vector, updating each value independently without considering any internal structure. This approach is called a vector-based optimizer. But can we explicitly account for the underlying metric structure of the model parameters? Linear layers are especially common in neural networks. Here, a linear layer transforms the input vector x into an output vector z. Each output z is just a weighted sum of the input x, where the weights themselves are the trainable parameters. We can describe this input-output relationship concisely using a matrix vector product. To update the weights, we first calculate the momentum for each parameter. But with vector-based atomizers like Atom, the momentum for a linear layer, naturally a 2D matrix, tends to become almost row rank in practice. This means that only a small number of dominant directions really drive the updates, while many other directions contribute very little. The Muon optimizer tackles this issue by orthogonalizing the momentum matrix. By doing so, Muon amplifies the effect of rare directions the directions that typically receive small or infrequent updates. Even though these rare directions seem minor, they are often essential for effective learning and can help capture more nuanced patterns in the data. Let's get more concrete. Suppose we have a 2D momentum matrix, which we call M. Orthogonalization is the process of finding a new matrix O that is as close as possible to M but with the special property that its rows and columns are all orthogonal to each other. A key property of orthogonal matrices is that their transpose is also their inverse. To build some intuition, imagine a momentum matrix as a single point in the high dimensional space of all possible matrices. Our objective is to find the nearest matrix O to M that satisfies the orthogonality condition. This sounds hard. Luckily, we have a powerful method for this, singular value decomposition. Let's make this more intuitive with a concrete example. A 2D matrix M defines a linear transformation. Think of applying the matrix M to the standard basis vectors. When we multiply M by 1, 0, we get 2, 0. This is just the first column of the matrix M. Next, if we multiply M by 0, 1, we get 1.5, 1.0, which is the second column. In a sense, a 2D matrix records how the transformation moves the basic vectors 
to new position in space. These four numbers fully determine how we transform any input 2D vectors. Remarkably, any linear transformation can be broken down into three steps. A rotation, followed by a stretching or shrinking along each axis, and then another rotation. Mathematically, this process is called Singular Value Decomposition, or SVD. It allows us to express any 2D matrix as the product of three special matrices, U, S, and V transpose. When we apply a linear transformation to a vector, we can think of it as first rotating by V transpose, then scaling each coordinate by the diagonal entry in S, and finally rotating again by U. Both U and V are orthonormal matrices, which means that their rows and columns are mutually orthogonal and have unit lengths. This means that we can use SVD to tackle the orthogonization problem. By computing the SVD of our momentum matrix, then setting all the singular values in S to 1, we obtain the orthogonal matrix we want. Easy, right? But performing SVD on a matrix is computationally intensive. We cannot afford running this step for every update iteration when training our model. Luckily, there is an efficient alternative. We can use something called an R polynomial matrix. This function takes a matrix X as input and computes the weighted sum of X and X X transpose times X. But why might this be useful? Let's unpack how this helps with our 2D matrix example. First, we can rewrite the equation by factoring out the matrix M. Then we substitute for M using its SVD form. Notice that the product between V and V transpose equals the identity matrix, since V is also normal. Because S is a diagonal matrix, multiplying it by itself just squares each of its diagonal entries. As we distributed the matrix multiplications, certain terms like U transpose U simplify to the identity, leading to a much cleaner expression. In the end, we see that the left side of the equation has the matrix U, while the right side has the matrix V transpose. As a result, we can combine the terms to further simplify the expression. This says that applying an R polynomial matrix function to M acts on its singular values in the same way as applying the function to each singular value individually, then reconstructing the matrix with the original singular vectors. This principle applies to any R polynomial, including higher order variants like a fifth order polynomial. By choosing appropriate values for the coefficient a, b, and c, we can push the singular values closer to 1, or without explicitly computing the SVD. Suppose we set a to 1.5, b to minus 0.5, and c to 0. We can visualize the effect of this function on a singular value by plotting its input-output relationship. The record represents how an input value x is mapped to the output value y. We will focus on the input range between 0 and 1, since our singular values will fall within this interval. Our goal here is to turn any input values to an output value that is closer to 1. To visualize this, we plot the yellow dots evenly spaced along the x-axis between 0 and 1. After applying the function, notice how these yellow dots are moved toward 1 on the y-axis. This is great! Let's see what happens when we apply this function repeatedly. Each time we apply the function, all points are pulled closer to 1. In the plots below, we can see how the function behaves over several iterations. After 5 iterations, almost all input values end up very close to 1. Now let's try changing the coefficients to see how this affects the transformation. For example, we might say a equals to 2, b equals to minus 1.5, and c equals to 0.5. Here, the red curve shows the new R polynomial function. By plotting the function after each iteration, we can see that the values converge to 1 even more quickly with these coefficients. But is this the best we can do? Let's tune the value of A, B, C so that we can get even faster convergence. 
First, increasing the value of a is crucial, as this coefficient primarily controls how quickly small initial singular values converge towards 1. Second, it turns out empirically we don't have to make the singular values converge to 1 exactly. We just need them to be bounded by a certain range, for example, between 0.7 and 1.3. This leads to a tuned coefficients of a, b, and c. After just a few iterations, we can map any singular values between 0 and 1 to the desired range. With this trick, we can now write down the algorithm. For each update iteration, we first compute the gradient gt using backpropagation. We then update the momentum as an exponential moving average of the past gradients. Next, we normalize the 2D momentum matrix so that it has unit norm. This ensures that the initial singular values are all between 0 and 1. We repeat this orthogonalization process 5 times to get matrix O, and then use O to update the parameters. Each iteration involves only matrix multiplications, which can be efficiently computed with GPUs, without the need to compute SVD. This method is called Momentum Orthogonization by Newton Shorts, or MUON. But when scaling up to train a larger model, the performance gains over Adam W diminish. To resolve this issue, we add the weight decay mechanism as used in Adam W. In addition, we adjust the learning rate by taking account the size of the 2D matrix. The two improvements help stabilize the training of large models. But there's still a challenge. Researchers have observed that as training continues, the attention logics can grow larger and larger, which may cause the training process to become unstable. Where does that come from, and how can we fix it? Consider a simple scenario. Suppose we have a sequence of 4 tokens. Each token is mapped to an embedding vector of dimension d. Let's call the matrix of these embeddings x. For simplicity, we'll focus on self-attention in the first transformer block, although the situation is similar in all layers. We obtain the query, key, and value representations by projecting the input embedding x with the parameter matrix wq, wk, and wv. Next, the attention mechanism computes a weighted sum of the value vectors, where the weights are determined by the attention scores. The attention logics before the softmax are computed by multiplying the query matrix q with the transpose of the key matrix k. Here, we substitute the expressions of q and k into the formula and further simplify the attention calculation. Note that the matrix X and its transpose denotes the embedding vectors, which are typically normalized to have unit norms. To prevent the attention logics from becoming excessively large, we must control the scale of WQ and WK. A common strategy is to apply a scaling vector to these matrices. During training, we monitor the maximal value of the attention logics. If it exists a certain threshold tau, we calculate a scaling ratio denoted as gamma. The idea is simple. When the attention logics surpass the threshold tau, we simply scale the relevant model parameters by the factor gamma to keep them in check. Because both WQ and WK contribute to the attention logics, we scale each of these metrics by the square root of gamma. The revised algorithm looks like this. First, we update the model parameter theta using muon optimizer. Next, if the maximal attention logic is larger than tau, we rescale both wq and wk by multiplying them with the square root of gamma. This trick is called qk clip. By doing so, we directly constrain the attention logics, ensuring that they stay within a safe range by rescaling the query and key projection weights. This looks great. But in practice, self-attention consists of multiple hands. We achieve this by splitting the query, key, and value matrix into several hands, four in our example. For each hand, we regroup Q, K, and V, compute attention independently, and concatenate outputs from all hands 
and project them with an output matrix WO. When the maximal attention logics go beyond the threshold, it does not make sense to rescale all the hands in the same way. Instead, we introduce an individual scaling factor for each hand to control their logics separately. But things get tricky if we want to use multi-hand latent attention, MLA, proposed by DSEQ. MLA compresses the query, key, and value representations into a low-rank space to reduce the size of the KV cache. This compression is performed using a down projection matrix, which produces latent representations. These compressed latent vectors are then mapped back to the query, key, and values for each attention hand using the corresponding R projection matrices. But a challenge will arise because this low rank key value compression does not work with rotary position embedding. To overcome this limitation, researchers propose a decoupled rope technique, which introduces extra multi head queries and a shared key to encode positional information. For MLA, the query, key, and values are regrouped for each head. Specifically for the query, we concatenate the compressed query component QC with the rotated query QR. Similarly, the key is constructed by concatenating the compressed key KC with its rotated counterpart KR. When using multi-head latent attention, we need to carefully decide how to rescale these four matrices. For the R projection matrix, we rescale the parameters for each hat individually. The row component deserves special attention. In this setup, each hat has its own rotary query, WQR, but all hats share a single rotary key matrix, WKR. If we were to apply the same perhaps scaling for both, the shared WKR matrix will be rescaled multiple times, which is undesirable. To handle this properly, we rescale only the hash specific rotary queries WQR by their respective gamma edge, while leaving the shared rotary key matrix WKR unchanged. This technique is called muon clip. Let's compare training with and without muon clip. With muon clip applied as shown on the right, the maximum attention logics are effectively capped and quickly stabilized demonstrating the effectiveness of QK clip regulation. This helps the optimizer maintain steady and reliable training. I hope you enjoyed this overview. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.